The sun's coming back out. It's going to look wonderful out today. Um, our, our Sunday school kids are going to be joining us in a few minutes. And we are celebrating our graduates today. Woohoo! Not only our high school graduates, but those who have graduated with advanced degrees too. And we, um, are, we are so proud of everybody. Out at the information desk, there's lists of high school graduates and college graduates that are out there. Take a look and keep these people in your prayers as we continue, uh, and they continue, to go through life in the next part of their journey. It's going to be um, wonderful. And so we'll, we'll recognize you guys a little bit later. And um, it'll be a wonderful time as we gather all together. Gathering together here this morning, we are so grateful that you are here. If you're visiting with us today, please know that you are welcome here in God's house and that you are welcomed by us also. Um, please know that um, everything is at your disposal. If there's a way that we can be of service to you in mission or ministry, we'd love to hear about it. Please fill out that little white and blue card that's in the pew and we'll be sure to be in contact with you. It's a great time to be here today, and we're on the sixth Sunday of Easter, and as we talk about that today, we're going to talk a little bit about that favorite thing, love. Love is in the air. Love is in the air. So we're going to do some crowdsourcing before we, um, before we get started this morning. So please stand up and greet someone this morning, welcome them here, and ask where they have seen love at work this week. Where have you seen love? Where have you seen it?
God has a lot of reasons to love us, and we've got 10,000 more reasons to love God, so please stand up for, excuse me, I am a friend of God. There we go. I'm already skipping up into the program here. But we're going to remember that, that wonderful love that God has for us, that we are friends in that love together. Please sing along. gospel, uh, Pastor Sue's going to share a little bit about how Jesus talks to his disciples and he says, you know, if you love me, uh, then you'll follow my commandments. Um, and it's just amazing how if we love God and if we trust God, you know, God is always there. God is just there. Sometimes we don't even see. But uh, that notion of calling out for God, of trusting God, if, of asking for God's help, helps us understand God is always around us. And so let us sing for joy.
Would you join me in prayer? Gracious God, we come to you. We sing for joy because you are our strength. You remind us day in and day out that your love is so available to us and that you have empowered us to be your presence in this earth so no, none might feel alone. On this day, we celebrate our children and hear their singing. On this day, we celebrate the accomplishments of graduates who are ready to begin new parts of their lives and new journeys. We remember that you are with us. You are our strength wherever we go, whatever we do. And we are your disciples to be your love in this earth. Guide us as we worship today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The reading today is from the 17th chapter of Acts. Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand as you are able to receive today's gospel. The Holy Gospel according to John, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me, because I live you also will live. On that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Dear friends, grace and peace to you this day in fullest measure through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, as Pastor John said, we're on the sixth Sunday of Easter, and we continue on. You remember that last Sunday, Pastor John talked about that 14th chapter of John with those familiar words, you know, that I've gone, and, and like our Sunday school kids sang about this morning, you know, that there's a place for you. You know, I go to prepare a place for you. In my father's house, there are many mansions. There are many rooms. There's a place for you. And comforting words that we hear about that, which is great. 
The second part of this, um, as we continue on into the 14th chapter, these verses may not be quite as familiar, although sometimes John always sounds like John, so, you know, it's, it's all there. But they may not be quite as familiar to us because they are this one that begins to talk about the Holy Spirit that will be with us, the advocate, the comforter that will be there. And Jesus promised, I will not leave you orphaned. And I remember, I, I always liked those words, and I do remember specifically this passage of gospel when it was preached in my first year of seminary. It was preached by one of the seniors. They, uh, they let the seniors preach, but not on the days when we celebrated the communion. So, you know, then the professors had to preach. But this was preached by one of the seniors, and it was somebody that I'd been in class with, and I highly respected and really liked him. And uh, actually, he's now a bishop. <laughs> So, you know, then he was just Don. Now he's the bishop. But he preached on this text. And as he read this and talked about this and said, I will not leave you orphaned. And I thought, yeah, kind of how I'm feeling. Because this senior class was leaving. And I thought how important they had been for me in that first year of seminary. And kind of a tear sort of went down my cheek. And I thought, you are leaving us orphaned. Wait a minute, you're not going to be here. And maybe, maybe we all have some of those feelings today. As I look at some of our seniors that are here, and I think about you guys, and I say, you're leaving us. Dog on you. But yay. So there's kind of these mixed feelings about this here, especially on a day when we celebrate all that you have achieved and what is to come. But I began to look at this text again, and I, I kind of backed up a little bit to the first part of it. And what kept hitting me was not the part about being left or being orphaned or not being orphaned, but that Jesus begins to talk to his disciples who are going to be without him about love. And he starts in this section and says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And I thought, huh. I thought I really did love Jesus, but I know that there's not a day that goes by that I don't break one of those commandments. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments, and I will ask God, and God will give you the other advocate, the Holy Spirit, the comforter to be with you, so you won't be alone. And I thought, wait, 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 hold a minute. Wait, is this conditional? If I love you, you'll do this for me? Now I've done that with my kids. <laughs> what parent hasn't? You know, if you do this, I'll do this. If you love me, you'd make your bed in the morning, you know? If you love me, you'd finish your homework without asking, you know? Uh, that seems so manipulative, and I thought, really? And then I began to look at some other comments that people were making as we were kind of playing with this text this week, and, and you, can, you can sort of massage this, this if at the beginning of the sentence, people were saying in Greek, you know, could, it could mean, since you love me, or when you love me, or, and I was like, man, still seeming to be so, so conditional here. And then I read it a little bit closer, and it says, you will keep my commandments. And I thought, oh, what were Jesus' commandments? So we're just not talking about the Ten Commandments that Moses got in the Old Testament, that whole list of thou shalt nots. What were the commandments that Jesus gave? And you look at this in its context, and this is coming right after. This is this whole farewell discourse here. This is after the Last Supper that they were together, after the supper where Jesus in the middle of the meal, you know, or at the beginning of this whole thing says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wash your feet, which was the lowliest job. And he washes the disciples' feet, and then he gives them that new commandment. Love others as I have loved you. 
That's what he's talking about. The command to love other people as he has loved them. And then it began to make more sense because it was the kind of love that wasn't defined really easily, but it was defined by an action. Now you can Google love and you'll get tons of definitions. You'll get tons of definitions on the internet. If you click that little images button, you'll get a lot of these slides, you know, that'll they make the quotes really pretty. You know, and there'll be stuff about love like that. You know, I saw that you were perfect and so I loved you. Then I saw that you were not perfect and I loved you more. And I thought, oh, that's nice. I like that. I like that. But that's not totally what Jesus is talking about here. And it's not that definition of love that comes later as we read Paul's writings where Paul has that, that great chapter writing to the church in Corinth and says, you know, love is patient, love is kind, love doesn't boast. Love. It's, it's not those things. Those describe love. But Jesus is talking here about a kind of love that's an action. And so this seemed to fit better. If you love someone, you better prove it. Because love is not a noun to be defined, but a verb to be acted upon. And that seemed to make a little bit more sense. So I began to think about that this week, and I thought, I'm going to look around. Where do I see love? Same question I asked you. And there were some interesting answers, you know, see it between parents who are celebrating an anniversary, see it between seniors gathered, get to gathered together again. Where do we see love? And as I continued to look through the week, a story popped up. A story popped up on, on my news feed, and, and I wanted to share it with you. There were a number of stories, because I think through stories, that's where we get an image of what love is today. So someone recounting about an airplane flight that they had took, and they were on the airplane, they'd gotten on, and she said, you know, when, you got on, when I got on the airplane, it was just like, everybody was on the airplane was like, ugh. You know, they'd been tired of waiting, they were tired of going through all the security checks, they'd gotten at the plane, and it was like, just get the plane going, because I want to go where I'm going. So it was just kind of, you know, have you ever been in a place where there's just kind of a ugh kind of atmosphere? And, and then she said, and then a young man came on board with his parents. And he was so full of joy that it changed the whole tenor in the entire plane. He was excited about this airplane flight. And it changed everybody's perspective. The young man had Down syndrome, and he was having a great time during that flight until they got sort of to the end of the flight, and he wasn't feeling so good. And he laid down in the center aisle, and his parents couldn't get him up. And they were nearing the destination, and the attendants had notified the pilot, and the pilot said, we can't land the plane unless everyone's in their seat. He had to get up, and he wasn't budging. They had tried everything. They couldn't lift him up into the seat. They couldn't make him go. He was just laying there complaining about how bad he felt. Smart pilot that it was, he came over the loudspeaker system and said, is there a teacher on board? Is there perhaps a special ed teacher on board the plane? And a woman got up. And she came forward and she laid down on the floor next to the young man. And they began to talk. And she asked him his name and how he was and where he was from and began stroking his hand kind of quietly. And they created a bond together, you know. And he said, I don't feel good. And she said, I get it. Sometimes I don't feel good on the plane either. Maybe you'd feel better if we sat together. And he got up and they sat together on the plane and 
She held his bag for him as he emptied the contents of his stomach, some on the bag and some on her. And all the while, she kept up a quiet conversation with him. Little did she know that in the seat behind, there was a physician. And he related later, he said, you know, I've always been prepared as I go on a flight for the pilot to ask, is there a doctor on board? He said, I've never heard one ask for a teacher. (laughs) But he said, to be truly honest, I would not have known what to do. And so I watched, and I took mental notes. Next time I'll be more prepared. But what everyone saw was love in action, an acceptance of who everyone was, an appreciation for the gifts that they had, and the collective wisdom that came. It was love in action. I talked to some of my friends online and asked them for their stories. And one of my colleagues who's in Canada sent me a couple of her favorite stories. And one I think is especially poignant too story of love in the flesh in a different way. There was a young man named John Keith, and he grew up during the days of the Depression. And it was 1937, and John was graduating from eighth grade. He was the first person in his family to go that far in school. And he had received notification that he was going to get the first place medal in his class. He was very excited, except for one thing. He told his mother that everybody had to wear long pants for the graduation ceremony. Now remember, this is in the days of short pants or knickers and long pants, and she said, we don't have the money to buy another pair of pants for you. As any 12-year-old would, he stomped out of the room and said that I'm not going to graduation. In fact, I'm running away. She said, well, don't pack your bags just yet. And about a week later, his mother came to him and said, let's go down to the tailors and get your pants. Okay. They rode the bus together, and he was very excited. And as they got off the bus... They began to walk the block to the tailors, and she said, stay here just one minute, I'm going in here for a second. And she went into another building and came back out a little bit later. They walked to the tailors, and the tailor that had fit him with pants all the time was said, I'm going to make you the best pair of pants, you're going to look great. Fit him to the pants, hemmed them up. And as he walked out with his brown paper bag tied with string with the pants in it, he felt like a million bucks. His mother had opened a small brown envelope and carefully counted out the money. The pants were $3.50, and there were four crisp $1 bills. She took the 50 cents change, put it back in her purse, And on the bus ride home, he was looking out the window and finally got a little bored as they neared their stop and looked across at his mother, who carefully had her hands folded across her purse in her lap, and noticed that the thin gold band that she had always worn on her left finger was gone. She had sacrificed her wedding band for his pants. He never forgot that day, nor those pants. It was love in action, a sacrifice. These are the kinds of things that Jesus is talking about with his disciples. Love as I have loved you. If you love me, you'll keep my commands the kind of love that's not just about obedience to the commands, but it's about sacrifice. It's about putting another person first instead of yourself. It's about valuing others 
It's about including them. Like the young teacher that I heard about who also taught a special ed class. It was her first year teaching, and at the end of the year, she was being married, and she invited her whole class of special ed students to be the flower girls and ring bearers. It's the kind of love that Jesus exemplified when he feeds and when he teaches and when he heals. It's the kind of love that creates and finds you when you're lost and comforts you in the dark of night. Love one another as Jesus has loved us. And the great thing about this is that we don't do it alone. Jesus says, I'm sending you another, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, the comforter to be with you. This spirit of truth that each one of us at the time of our baptism is made and sealed with the sign of the cross and given the gift of the Holy Spirit that dwells in us forever. Now, sometimes we're a little bit annoyed at that spirit because it does kind of move us and pricks our conscience a little bit. But the spirit is there to be with us always, to never leave us orphaned and alone, to help us live out this love in the world today. It's tough to do this in the world today. It's tough when we read the news and we see the news every single day. It seems like another shoe is dropped where we might think of the world as almost like a centipede, you know? When, is, when, when are we going to stop dropping all these things? Because we live in a world of chaos. But our job, our job is to love each other as Jesus loved us. Serving and sacrificing, valuing each other, including each other. These are the things of love that Jesus speaks about and gives us that Holy Spirit. And it's not all dismal and it's not all work. It's like this photo that I saw this week of a father and his daughter dressed for Halloween. He sacrificed. He's Red Riding Hood because she wanted to be the wolf. It brings us a chuckle, but it brings us a realization that love is in action. It's not a noun. It's something we do physically all the time if we're following the command of Jesus. Love one another as I loved you. And it opens doors for us that we may have otherwise thought would be closed. Those who love me will be loved by God. And I will love them and reveal myself to them. You already do know and you do love. So continue to love, dear friends. Let the Spirit work in you and continue to be lovers of each other in the world today for that will overcome all hatred. Amen. I invite you now to stand and join as we proclaim who we are and what we believe in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, Father Almighty.
love, and uh, you came up with lots and lots of places where you've seen love. There's lots of places that God is at work in, in our very daily lives. And uh, 10,000 raisins are all we can sing about. So let's sing like we've never sung before. God, our souls worship you. We praise you. We give you thanks because you do not leave us alone. You remind us that you are always near. Your strength, your love, your power, your help is as close as our call and our prayers. As we gather this day, we, we gather to affirm that in ourselves and in each other. We gather this day to be nurtured in your love. And we gather this day 
to ready us to go out and add love into this world. Whether lying on the ground with a young man who's frightened and doesn't feel well. Or to sacrifice so that others may have. We ask you, gracious God, to to let our love, the love of this church, always be present. The love of us as we are your church. To be present in people's lives. And that you would somehow lay on our hearts some name or some presence or some situation that calls for your love this week. We ask you, gracious God, to be with those who are ill, those whose spirits are broken, those who are sad or hurt, distressed, whose lives have been fallen apart. And likewise be amidst our world, whether it be with leaders or people who are just interacting with one another that between the religions and between the nations between the races between the differences of people we would recognize there is one spirit one God who draws us together we ask you to guide those who begin their journey as they end one part of their life and go to the next, to guide them and remind them that you will go with them. And now, gracious God, call our prayers together. Hear us as we pray for those in need. Hear us as we pray for ourselves. Hear us as we praise your name, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And let's take a moment to share God's peace and God's love with one another. share a little bit about the love that I saw this week. It was actually the, the love was some people who really took care of one patient. You can be seated. Um, and it was um, one of our patients. He uh, had kind of come into our service. He really didn't have funds and our CEO offered to take his those expenses. All, all gratis. Um, but he was far from home. His home was in Iowa and uh, he wanted to go home. He and his family. And so uh, we were able to contact another group who was able and is willing to take on his care again out of their own expenses. And uh, we were able to find a, a Medicare company who was able to drive them again. And these were people, the people making those decisions are people who never met this man, never met his family, didn't know anything about him, but they loved and that's the power of love. When the power of love is in us, it goes beyond. And so today, as we gather our offerings, our gifts of love, they are love. We may never see the person who they help. We may never see the person who comes to faith or comes to realize that God is with them. We may never see the person who's given a meal, who's, who's hungry. We may never see any of those things, but we do this out of love, and we trust that God's love is all over the world. So let us 
share our gifts of love. us and you nurture us and you help us to grow as we were just reminded of the way you've helped 
our graduates grow. We are reminded that you do this every day of our lives. That every breath, every morsel of food, every breath we take, every encouragement you give us helps us to grow and be your children. And that you'd never leave us orphaned. And so as we gather at this meal, we remember that you here nurture us again. You remind us and call us to be the people you've always called us to be. People of love and the body of Christ. And so we gather and remember how Jesus, when he was ready to leave, when he was facing his death, loved us even more. And he took bread and he gave thanks. And he broke it. And he gave it to his friends and he said, take and eat. This is my body given for you that you might always know my love. So eat it and remember me. And then he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it for everyone to drink. And he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, a new promise that I make to you that love is always going to be stronger than hate. That love can heal everything. And this covenant is in this blood. Drink it and remember me. And so, as the Holy Spirit gathers us together and calls us as one, we pray those words Jesus gave us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. This is God's meal. This is God's table. And you are God's guests. So remember that you are always in God's presence. You may be seated. We receive communion today uh, by the individual cup. Please take a piece of bread or a gluten-free wafer, if you prefer, uh, from one of the pastors. Um, and then uh, take one of the cups afterwards. And the outer ring is the uh, red liquid, which is wine. And the inner circle is the amber liquid, which is grape juice. Take those and drink and uh, deposit your cup in the little canister out here. All are welcome. God's table is prepared, and all are God's guests.
invite you to stand as you are here. And now may the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. At this time, I'd like to call forward our seniors who are graduating this year. Um, there is a list of them on the information desk in case you don't have to come up in alphabetical order. But Abby Albright, Sarah Becker, Alisa Christensen, Travis Kenning, Logan Leonard, Jack Maynellis. You can start coming up at any time. <laughs> Alexa Molitor, um, Samantha Myers, Eric Newman, Tommy Olnick, Lauren Shore, Natalie Smith, and Alisa Steinbrenner. Now, they always like to go over to this side. <laughs> and um, this is really a fun time for me because um, I remember these kids from the time that they were in junior high. You were a lot shorter. <laughs> you were a lot shorter. Um, but it's been really fun for me to see them go through junior high and senior high and now um, go on to greater and better things. We hope that when you're home and when you're in town that you will still come and be a part of this congregation. Know that this congregation is always here for you and that whether I'm here or not, this is a congregation and a place where you are welcome, always. So regardless of time that passes by, this is your place. You will encounter many transitions during your life and this is just one of them. And so this little benediction that I'm giving you, which I give to the seniors, um, is here for you to remember. This is the benediction we will use today. Um, it was a gift to me uh, in a class that I had a long, long time ago, but a benediction that has stuck with me because it's for times of transition. Now I framed it and put it in this lovely frame for you, and I expect that should I ever visit your dorm room, <laughs> I will see it there, right beside your bed, or right beside your phone. Well, no, your phone will be in your pocket, but that's okay. But somewhere, if it's not, if it's packed away someplace, maybe sometime in the future you'll come upon it, and you'll remember this time always. So will you join me in prayer as you too hear the words of this wonderful benediction. Go now with God. Be not tempted to stay in the safety of known places. Move from where you are to where God points. Go now with God. Be not tempted to go only in your time, when it suits, when it is sure. For now is God's time. Go now with God. Choose not to go alone. Go in the faith that there is no wilderness so vast, no way so confused, that God is not already there to show you the way. Amen, and congratulations to our seniors. As we, um, as we conclude our services, you guys can sit down now, because that, that's all you get, sorry. <laughs> There's no scholarship money here. Um, um, we have a couple of announcements, um, uh, just to make sure that you continue to keep abreast of the Living News Weekly, make sure that you know things that are going on that are there, and also, um, our treasurer, Jake Baldwin, has, since we're heading into the summer months, our treasurer, has um, a word of advice and a request for you. So, Jake, and if you want a microphone, you can head up into the pulpit or you can just scream. Yes. <laughs>
um, yeah, so just take note of that to do it online. They'll pay with ease um, and help, that helps us all out because it evens out our cash flow and that helps us out when you're not here, um, your presence is still here because the lights are still um, on and the bills still keep rolling in through the summer months. And as far as the organ is concerned, we have a beautiful organ. We do use it at a lot of the services here and especially festival celebrations. And I know you don't hear it all the time, but it's not just a paperweight up here that looks pretty. Um, <laughs> it's a really nice instrument and it kind of what blue on it is an electronic part that's kind of like the hard drive on your computer. So um, that's what we need to replace and we're, we're kind of looking to do that since it's an unbudgeted item. Um, we're asking that if anyone wants to contribute to kind of do that and mark an envelope with that and we'd be happy to, happy to help that defray the, defray the cost. Now as you go forward into the week, you've already received your benediction and blessing for God, but watch for signs of God's love in the world and love that is shown in action. Email me your stories, I'd love to hear them and we'll continue to keep um, looking for signs of God's love in the world today. Let's sing along with the band as we stand up and move our way out into the world as we live with God's love every single day.